Hi, welcome. I'm Adrian Alexander with the Absolute Sound. I have a surprise for you today. I'm going to introduce my friend Sam. Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started with this review. Sure. Uh, my name is Sam Franey. I come to the uh, audiophile world via studio engineering and live sound reinforcement. Uh, I also work at Randy's Records where Adrian is a frequent customer. So that's uh, kind of how I got tied into this. As you heard, Sam's a pro audio guy. Now, that's kind of like salespeople and accountants. They don't really get along that well. Sure. However, that's not the case between us. Of course, Can you of explain a little bit of that and why? Yeah, you, what's yeah. What's your opinion? Uh, I feel like the the arguments are never ending. I feel like uh, a lot of pro audio folks think that uh, audiophiles spend a lot of money on things that they shouldn't. Uh, but I will say this, uh, you know, to those folks that uh, I've spent a lot of time in world-class, multi-million-dollar control rooms. But for me personally, the most captivating listening experiences that I've had have been high-end two-channel home audio systems that were for personal use. Um, and whether you're a pro audio person or an audiophile, I think the most important thing is that your equipment is set up correctly and operating at its peak performance. Well said and thank you. And by the way, for s some of you pro audio guys that may be listening, it's not an indictment. We're not making fun of you or putting you down. We're, we're just sharing experiences here which segues into our review today. And our review today is the Analog Magic Cartridge Software Sit Up and Test LPs. I've set up cartridges, you set up cartridges. I know at the shop, people come in and buy turntables, so you, you do that. And as you mentioned, I think accuracy is important. Now, before I started to use this software, I thought I was pretty accurate. I thought I, I, thought I was doing a good job. You know, and, and then I, I got this software and I thought to myself, nah, nah, I'm not off that much. I mean, I'm sure it's a line and I'm sure it's this. And, you know, ego aside, I was totally wrong. And basically, what does that mean? That means that I wasn't getting the best out of the vinyl record. So in the package, it comes with two discs, excuse me, two records, 133, 145, and also comes with a, a small flash drive. Um, I, use a, I utilized it with the 33 uh, record. Sam, what was your experience? Yeah, same same thing for me. I used the 33 RPM disc um, because I almost, I primarily listen in 33. Um, I, you know, I've got a lot of records that are 45, but most of my listening is for 33. If you have two tone arms, um, it would be an awesome thing, I think, to, to set up one for 33 and one for 45 because they are going to have slightly different characteristics as far as um, the record's force on your stylus while it's playing. So that's a cool option. I agree. Inside the box is also that flash drive that Adrian talked about. Uh, the flash drive just contains a product license, so it doesn't actually have the software on it. It's just a license uh, to run the software, to access the software. So for anyone who's used like Pro Tools in the past, it's basically like your iLock. It just opens the software. That's true. And I also want to mention um, it's Windows based, but if you have a Mac, you can download Parallels, you know, do the 14-day trial or whatever. That's your business. You can download Parallels and use it that way as well. Uh, in addition to the two test discs and the USB flash drive, there is also a recommended interface. It's the Art USB Phono Plus. It is a really small, simple interface. Uh, it would be great for anybody who's looking to digitize some of their LPs or, you know, considerable portion of their collection or someone working in music production that wants to take some samples of records. Uh, it is also handy because it doesn't have an external power supply. It's powered off USB, so you could, you know, just drag it around with that in the laptop. You've got a portable, nice system for using this software. And again, I had to go into this with an open mind because I, I challenged Sam. I said, Sam, look, I got this software, man. I think you might be inaccurate on some of your sit-ups. And he was, what, what was your response? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, he was humble enough to say that he, yeah, he, he might be in a, it might be a little bit inaccurate. And after he used it, uh, what did you, what did you realize? I still think protractors are a handy tool. Uh, they're great for, you know, setting overhang, but things like azimuth, zenith, uh, VTA, setting your anti-skate, uh, now a protractor and, you know, kind of conventional methods feel a little inexact. Well, okay, I have a question, and I agree with everything that you said because I've had that same experience. So let's take it from a scale 
to uh, from a scale from one to one to ten, ten being the highest, where would you say? Let's take uh, let's VTA. Sure. Where would you say your VTA was before you used this software? Ten being the highest. Sure. Uh, I mean that stuff. VTA is it's okay to set visually and like there are a lot of tools for helping set that visually but i i noticed huge decreases in distortion based on the test disk after setting the vta with the software as opposed to how i had done it before for sure vta for me has always been kind of a difficult process i why? feel like why i feel like you know i spend all this time looking at manufacturer recommendations i'm looking at forums i'm spending time looking through a little acrylic protractor at my cantilever and my stylus angles and it just never seems to be right no matter how big the headache okay all right so share the experience using the software yeah um with the analog magic it's almost like a game like you sort of get the vta as close as you can using your protractors using recommendations and then you just make slight adjustments uh, to minimize the distortion numbers that you're seeing, and it's kind of fun. And that's on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But, and by the way, I want to address that. This, this isn't rocket science. It's really simple to sit up on the screen, so there's no reason to be intimidated. If this isn't something that you're comfortable with, maybe you have a, maybe you have a child or a friend that can help you or a grandchild and walk you through. It's real simple. It, it's, 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 it's like reading a book just with pictures. It tells a story. and. It's real simple to use. So I don't, I don't want you to feel like it's some, you know, rocket science kind of thing, because it's not. And if a pro sound guy can figure it out, anybody can. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> so Sam, let me ask you a question. After sitting the overhang, what's the first thing that you wanted to do next using the Analog Magic software? Oh, yeah. Um, for me, I think I was more excited to jump into just Azimuth and Zenith, kind of your two most basic setup components of a cartridge, but probably the most important parts of setting up a, a cartridge. Okay. Um, for me, in the past, like something as simple as channel balance is something that I noticed in my analog setup I had issues with. You know, I'll... In what, in what way did you have issues? Can you explain? Yeah, one of my channels would just be hotter than the other. You know, whether it's my right or left, sometimes it would go back and forth, um, especially across a disc. Uh, it would, you know, I would have slight variations between which channel was louder. Okay, so that's before you use the software. For sure. So once you use the software, that was resolved. That was, I think that was the very first thing I noticed because that's something I've always struggled with. I think that setting uh, your azimuth is difficult um, and it makes a huge difference in your channel balance. So not having that set up correctly will cause issues across the board. Just a brief interruption for some exciting news. AudioQuest has three new rack mountable PowerQuest models that take AudioQuest's comprehensive approach to AC power conditioning, addressing noise linearly to provide class-leading wide bandwidth noise reduction at better than minus 22 dB. The PowerQuest line starts at $459.95 in the U.S. for the PQ303 and goes up to $1299.95 for the PQ707, which includes transient power correction with up to 45 amps peak on-demand power for any amplifier. Visit audioquest.com for more information. And now, back to the show. So Sam, we talked about inconsistencies with some cartridge, cartridges made. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not, that's not an indictment on the companies making these. It's just they may be inconsistent. So address that if you would. Sure. Um, I think it's just a natural part of uh, cartridge manufacturing. The way that the stylus sits at the end of the cantilever isn't always the exact same from cartridge to cartridge. It makes uh, sense. Whether it's the same model even or the same make of cartridge, they can still vary. Um, so the most important part is that that stylus at the end of the cantilever is, is riding through the groove correctly. Um, and we're really trying to align that small diamond at the end of the cantilever. In real time, we can't sit there with a protractor um, or a little acrylic piece, you know, and watch and see how the stylus is moving through the groups. Um, so the discs use predefined test tones that give you real-time distortion numbers, and your whole job is basically just trying to minimize those distortion numbers as much as possible. Great. And were you able to do that using the software? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, t I too, was as well. I, I want to be clear about something. Let's go back to the protractor. What, in your opinion, is the best you can do using the protractor versus the software? 
Nice. Great question. Because pe people struggle with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think when using a protractor to try and set your azimuth and zenith, um, part of the issue is that you can really only align the cartridge body or the cantilever if you're really diligent with it, but neither of those things really account for the orientation of the stylus at the end of the cantilever. Let's talk about sitting anti-skate. Yeah, I, another thing that for me I think has always been kind of a laborious process of setting anti-skate. I've tried test discs, I've tried the blank discs where you try and see how quickly your, you know, uh, your tone arm is moving across a blank record. I've even done, you know, trying to set your uh, anti-skate based on your VTF, and all of these methods are flawed in, in one way or another. So again, the analog magic helped with that. Oh yeah. Because I have to say I agree with you. Um, also what I noticed with my VPI turntable, I didn't have to sit the anti-skate. Yeah. That was, that was a surprise to yeah, me. Yeah, I thought, I was blown away by that. In the manual they mention that a 12 inch tone arm tracking at two grams shouldn't need any anti-skate. Right. Um, and so I figured, you know, if that's the recommendation they're making, I'll try the software, let's see what it says. Yeah, so we're talking about the, the in the VPI yep. manual. Yeah, yep. okay, I read the no, same oh, thing. Oh, no, sorry, that excuse, was in this. Excuse me, a mistake, okay, in that manual. So you tried it, I mean, yeah, that's what I noticed. For me, I didn't have to do, I didn't have to sit the anti-skate, right. which blew me away, which is interesting because again, where you work at a record shop, um, you guys sell a few turntables because there's a lot of enthusiasts there. So you're back there sitting them up. So moving forward, this will be a better value for the customer because you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you could, I guess you could have a guilt trip and say and call everybody. Let me come. Let's let's use the software on your your turn turntable. But obviously, you can't do that. But right. but you found it as a very good useful tool. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Oh yeah. And in regards to the record store, if I could see more VPIs come in there to set up, that would be great. There you go. Again, coming from a pro audio guy. You know what? I have a nickname for Sam. I always call him a propeller head because, you know, he just he likes to know how things work. And I'm sure everybody watching this is curious because I know I am. So, Sam, bottom line, how was the sound, if at all, improved using Analog Magic? I'll let you elaborate on that. Yeah. Because, again, he's the pro audio guy. So, you know, yeah. here we go. Uh, Sound-wise, I feel like they're... It, there's almost no comparison. I, as I said before, something as simple as channel balance. If you don't have channel balance right, I don't even know where you go from there. Okay. Um, and I've always struggled with channel balance. Using protractors, using you know my my the best tools available to me in the past, I still had issues with the most simple fundamentals. Uh, after that, the world is kind of your oyster. You know, you get your channel balance right, then you start to get you know everything else right. You get your VTA right. Uh, you get your anti-skate set really well dialed in and you've got a really great listening experience ahead of you. I totally agree. And I, I want to say this because it's just been my personal experience. The moment I took my ego out of this and said to myself, maybe there's a different way. Maybe the way I've been doing it doesn't work. I was able to enjoy the benefits from that. So I'm sure any of you, any of you watching don't have an ego problem, but if you have one, Maybe that's something to consider because it was worth the wait. We haven't talked about the price. The price is $1,100 and I think it's a good value because of this. In the past, the way I was setting it up, it may have and probably did wear out my cartridges sooner than it should have. Also, I'm getting a better listening experience and I think, I think that's very minimal when you think about it. You might spend two to $10,000 for a cartridge. So, you know, it's the same as, you know, amplifiers and speaker wire. You want to bring the best out of your system. I think it's a great value for $1,100. So when you have a minute, check out Analog Magic's website. Magic is spelled M-A-G-I-K. So they can answer questions. In closing, I want to thank my friend Sam for participating in this and sharing your experience using Analog Magic. It's $1,100, we spoke about that. Um, so tell all your pro audio guys, this stuff works. Anyway, I have to tease you about that. So thank you for watching. <laughs>